Um, so as uh, Martin said, the title of the talk is uh, concordance or tension, cosmic concordance or tension. Um, but I thought for this very special audience in Cambridge, I might cheekily rename my talk, Catherine and George in our low versus high redshift quest to understand the universe. Because today what I want to share with you is some um, very hot off the press, new cosmological constraints, uh, our, our efforts to understand the low redshift uh, to understand the universe by directly probing the large scale structure in our sort of present day universe. Um, now these results um, that I'm going to share with you today are not just my own and um, they come from this um, fabulous group of people. These um, five papers hit the archive last Friday. Um, and I particularly want to um, highlight Marika Ascari down here, who um, coordinated this whole team with me uh, to create the uh, results I'm going to share with you today. Um, now, first of all, what is KIDS for anyone who hasn't heard of it yet? Uh, so it stands for the Killer Degree Survey. This is our fourth data release. Um, so we are finally, uh, Finally, truly are a killer degree survey. We're spanning more than a thousand square degrees now, and that's why this release is dubbed Kids 1000. Um, now, this is an ESO public survey. That means you all have full access um, to it. Um, it was designed to study uh, weak gravitational lensing, um, and to do that, you need really high resolution imaging. So, the absolute best weather conditions on Paranal were reserved to assemble this. Um, this survey. The pretty image that you can see here is just to give you an idea of scale of how much of the extra galactic sky um, we have observed with kids now. All we've done here is we've projected the large scale uh, structure maps that we've created from this survey up onto the sky over Paranel. And um, but one of these, what this image doesn't show you is actually where these uh, these stripes are on the sky. So let's go for the more uh, scientific version of that image. So here we are, here's our map of where we are on the sky. These pink stripes here are the Killer Degree Survey. And um, this imaging survey is taken with wavelengths from the optical all the way through to the near infrared. So there are nine different wave bands here and they're all at match depth, which is, and they're really quite deep imaging. So it's a lovely survey um, to work with for both the cosmology applications that I'm going to show you today, but also a whole range of other different applications. Um, so if you want multiband imaging data, go to the ESO archive and, and grab this data because it's a really nice data set. Um, now, the other things that you can see on this map are where our overlapping spectroscopic surveys are. And um, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is um, the cosmology that we can extract from these what I call same sky surveys. So where we have overlapping imaging and spectroscopic surveys. And we overlap with BOSS, this is the, the Sloan Statistical Sky Survey, and the Spectroscopic Survey of Luminous Red Galaxies. And also 2DF lens, which you can see in green here. Um, this is a uh, spectroscopic survey as well that was designed to mimic BOSS in areas where we didn't have BOSS spectroscopy but had good uh, data for studying gravitational lensing. Um, now, the results I'm going to show you today use three different probes of the large scale structure. So let me take you through what those three different probes are. Um, the first is called cosmic shear. So the idea is you look at distant galaxies in the distant universe. And as their light travels towards us across the universe, um, its path gets bent and distorted. Not nearly as distorted as this artistic impression <laughs> wants to show you here, but you get the idea. That as the light travels across the large scale structure, it gets bent and distorted. And so what I actually observe on the sky is it makes it appear that those distant galaxies are slightly aligned with each other. That's called cosmic shear, and that's our first probe of the large scale structure. Um, but what we can also do is look at how the galaxies are clustered within that large scale structure. So these pink dots here are to illustrate those, uh, the BOSS and the 2DF lens spectroscopic galaxies that I can measure the clustering for within the large scale structure. And I can also look at how the halos, the dark matter halos around these um, spectroscopic galaxies are lensing the background galaxies. So that's three different probes of the large scale structure. Cosmic shear, galaxy clustering, and the third one is called galaxy-galaxy lensing. 
Now these are all two point statistics and so uh, the combination of these three probes together is known as three times two point. Um, and that is kind of becoming now the standard probe that we use for when we're combining wheat lensing with, um, with different clustering surveys. Um, now, one of the um, absolute joys for me um, of having Zoom seminars is that it allows me to multitask. Oh, how many of my children's dinners have been created whilst watching seminars? So for those of you who may be multitasking this afternoon, I thought what I'd do is just jump straight in with the main headline result. And then you can decide how much of the rest of the seminar you want to focus on whilst you're peeling your potatoes or, or whatever you might be doing. Um, so this is our main result um, that we've got here. These are our cosmological constraints. Let me guide you around this plot for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, this axis here, sigma eight, that is how clustered uh, the, la the, the matter is today uh, in eight megaparsec spheres. Um, and here, omega m, the amount of matter in our universe. Um, in red, these are our constraints from our combined analysis of uh, this kids lensing survey with the spectroscopic data, so what's called this three times two point analysis. Um, you can compare that to our um, previous results from last year where we had half the survey area. And you can also compare it to our um, fabulous academic cousins in the dark energy survey here in, in yellow. And you can see that these results agree very, very well with each other. Um, now we can also compare this result to the grey constraints here from Planck. And this is a completely different measurement from what we're doing with these three times two point results in that uh, Planck is looking at the cosmic microwave background. And you know, Planck data is absolutely exquisite and it has this gorgeous fit to the data from the flat lambda CDM model, provides an excellent fit to the data. Um, and you can use that model to then infer what the clustering of the large scale structure is today. So that's using high redshift information to tell you about the low redshift universe. Now, the fact that we don't have a perfect agreement between our direct measurement of the clustering of the low redshift universe with the prediction that you get from the Planck observations analyzed with the flat lambda CDM model, the fact that those don't agree perfectly uh, tells you one of three things. Uh, the, if you want to uh, get particularly excited, and we do like to get particularly excited, then you can say that there's something wrong with that flat lambda CDM model. The fact that things don't work at high and low redshift means that that model is missing something. That would be exciting. Uh, your second answer is, uh, this is just statistical noise. Uh, we've looked at a strange part of the universe, maybe, and with more data, maybe our results will go up. Or your third answer is that there is some systematic error in either the lensing analysis or the CMB analysis, or both, uh, that's leading to this offset. And what I want to try and convince you of for the uh, rest of our time together is that the, the systematic errors aren't on our side. Um, so let me just give you the numbers. Um, the main parameter that we're measuring is, ooh, is this S8 parameter here, um, which is a combination of these two parameters. And we have the same overall precision as Planck now for that parameter. Um, but as I said, it's low. We are uh, three sigma in tension. Uh, with Planck, and that difference is driven by sigma eight. So if you want this whole seminar in uh, what would fit in a tweet, our answer is that the universe that we're seeing with kids is less clumpy than Planck would predict. So for those of you multitasking, that is the headline result. You may now put down your potatoes and focus entirely on the rest of the seminar, or you can carry on uh, with whatever you're doing. Okay. So uh, let's take this now at a bit more of a slower pace and think about where those results have actually come from. So we're going to start off, we, we have those three different probes of the large scale structure and we're going to start off just with the cosmic shear analysis. So that's looking at how correlated the shapes of galaxies are because the way their light has been lensed by all of the large scale structure in the universe between us and those galaxies. 
Now, in order to make that measurement, we need to know the position of the galaxy on the sky, but also its position in redshift. Um, so we are very lucky with kids in that we have these five, uh, sorry, these nine wavelength bands from the optical all the way through to the infrared, which give us really good photometric redshifts that allow us to bin our galaxies up into lots of different redshift slices. We have five in total, and that allows us to look at how the large scale structure is evolving with time. Now, um, Photometric redshifts are a really key ingredient. It would be fantastic if we had spectroscopy for everything, but we don't. So we use um, photometric redshifts. And here's just uh, an example of why it's so useful to have that big wavelength range when we're doing this analysis. Um, so this is an example of a spectral energy distribution of a galaxy at redshift 1.2, here in red. And uh, these different black uh, bands here are the different filter bands that we're using to make our analysis. And you can see that for this particular galaxy at redshift 1.2, if we just had the optical data, um, which uh, most lensing surveys have, just the optical, we wouldn't really know what redshift it was at because there are no features in the spectrum. But because we have this change to the near infrared, that allows us to isolate the galaxy at redshift 1.2. Um, so we can uh, measure photometric redshifts for everything, but there isn't a unique answer for a single galaxy. And this is one of the, um, the big challenges with this type of study. If you don't know, um, if you don't know where your galaxies are, then you don't know how much of the large scale structure have lens those galaxies. So we really need to accurately know our redshifts. And so we need to do more than just fit templates to our, um, to our photometry. Um, so we've done a new method this time around, um, which I think is really neat. Um, it's called, uh, it's a machine learning technique um, that gives you like really violently coloured images like this. Um, so <laughs> this is our self-organising map. Basically what we do is we take all of the information that we have about our galaxy. So all of the nine uh, magnitudes that we have, and then we construct all of the different combinations of colours that you could get. So U minus G, U minus R, U minus I, et cetera, et cetera. So as much information as we can possible, we feed into this machine learning uh, technique. And then it um, returns this map. Now, each one of these cells in this self-organizing map groups galaxies together that have similar properties in terms of their magnitudes and their colors. Um, now, once we have that map assembled with the galaxies all grouped together in these different um, properties, we then look to see where do the spectra lie. Um, now, the map that I showed you at the start just shows you the main footprint of kids. But in addition to that, we've gone out and we have imaged every single spectroscopic survey that we can see from Paranel just to pull as much spectroscopic data in as possible in order to calibrate our photometric redshifts. And the colour scale that you can see here just tells you about the redshift of the spectroscopy. Um, and you can see that these cells, when they're um, grid together, they're, they're doing a reasonable job at, at um, working out the redshifts of each of these galaxies. Um, so that's really useful. But one of the best things about this technique is these black cells that you can see here. This is where we have no spectroscopy. Okay, so these cells contain galaxies that we've imaged in our, um, in our imaging survey that we have photometry for, we've got a photometric redshift for, but there are n there's no spectroscopy that has the same properties. So these will be faint things that haven't been targeted by um, any of the spectroscopic surveys that we've looked at, or maybe they just might have weird noise fluctuations, again, that, that, uh, that aren't seen. But we can remove those galaxies from our analysis. We can just say we, we can't calibrate these galaxies, we don't know where they come from. And, um, oh, and the white cells here are just very, very low redshift um, cells. So these are calibrated by SDSS and Gamma. Okay, so that's um, really useful. We, because it's a brand new method for us, we validated it with a bunch of mocks. This is all work led by Angus Wright. Um, so what you can see here are the redshift distributions for those different tomographic bins. You can see we're getting to higher and higher redshift. The blue that you can see here are the different uh, mock data sets. We've got a bunch of different realizations. And in yellow, that is the rigid distribution that we reconstruct using this um, machine learning approach.
um, and it's uh, incredibly accurate, which is which is excellent. Um, but there is a drawback. Um, so we the, we gain in accuracy, but we trade in precision. So we have to throw out about fifteen percent of our galaxies in order to do that. But we think that's worthwhile because in this uh, age of precision cosmology actually accuracy is more important than precision so we can lose a bit of precision provided we're sure that our results are very accurate um, this isn't the only test we've done the photometric tests are really important so we've also looked at a, um, a clustering analysis all right so the idea here because we've got all this overlapping spectroscopy and photometry you say all right i think i know where these galaxies are I'm going to see if they're clustered to the spectroscopic galaxies at the same redshift. Um, if they are at the same redshift, then they should be clustered with each other. Um, if they're at different redshifts, then they won't be clustered with each other. And you can use this to reproduce the redshift distributions that you can see here. So these um, black dots here are the redshift distributions of these five different um, redshift bins that we've created. Um, and that's been inferred from just looking at the clustering between these different samples. And you can overplot the, uh, the redshift distributions that we get from our um, self-organizing map. And you can see that they fit really, really well. We can play around with sort of shifting them around to see if we can get a better fit. But um, it's a very good match. So we're feeling very confident about our photometric redshifts. Um, although we will return to this later because there's something that's maybe not quite perfect, but uh, definitely a step forward in our analysis there. Okay, so um, that gives us the uh, position on the sky, which we need in order to work out how much of the large scale structure that light has gone through. We also need to measure the shapes of the galaxies and um, to see how correlated they are on the sky. Now, uh, the light from these galaxies travels for about 10 billion light years. Uh, to get to us and then in the, like, the last nanosecond it's completely distorted and disturbed by the atmosphere, the telescope, the camera, all sorts of horrific things that cause distortions that's about 10 times larger than the cosmological distortion that you get from uh, this weak lensing effect. Um, so how are we going to deal with that? Well we are again lucky with the killer degree survey in that we have this new infrared data in that allows us to really cleanly separate the stars and the galaxies and um, so this is just a really simple colour colour plot here and you can see that the stars lie on this nice locus here and that's really quite well separated from the galaxies which live up here. So that's another bonus of having this new infrared data. The stars we know should appear as point sources and they don't because of all of this effect of the atmosphere. We can use that to really accurately map out all of the terrestrial effects and use that to invert and remove them from the galaxies. Um, now, there is a whole um, fabulous paper that is far too long um, that goes through all of the multiple different tests that we run to be sure that the distortions that we measure in the patterns of the galaxies on the sky are purely cosmological, that they aren't caused by terrestrial distortions. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you can go and read this paper by Ben Gibbon, or there's a full hour long seminar by Ben about all of the multiple different ways he tested this catalog. Um, you can uh, Google YouTube Ben Gibbon and you'll find it. Um, but I just picked one um, highlight result here, which is our B modes. Um, now, being in Cambridge, you'll be um, very passionate about B modes in terms of the CMB because they tell you all sorts of exciting things um, about uh, the CMB. But B modes in lensing terms is bad. So gravitational lensing only produces E mode distortions. And if you see B mode distortions, then it means that there is something wrong with your data set. There's some distortion in there that isn't cosmological in its origin. All right, oodles of data here, but let me guide you through it. Each one of these panels is a different correlation between our five tomographic redshift bins. So one one is the correlation between our two low redshift bins and five five between our two high redshift bins. Um, N here is just looking at the order of the distortion that we're looking at. Um, and super highly correlated data points here okay so don't do chi by i we've got these p values up in the corner here which takes into account the full correlation and tells you the probability that these data points are consistent with pure noise so a, a, a zero 
B mode. And they all are there. Each individual uh, bin combination is consistent with pure noise, as is uh, the full data set um, up here. Um, so that's good. That's, but that's just one test. There's a bunch of other stuff in Ben's paper um, looking at different ways to analyze the accuracy of our point spread function model. Um, when I started as a PhD student, I really wanted to understand dark matter and dark energy, and that's why I started doing gravitational lensing. But it turns out, in order to understand gravitational lensing, you need to understand how CCDs work and how readout electronics work. I now know more about these things than I ever wanted to know. We've identified a, a bunch of weird instrumental defects in uh, these CCDs that's um, particularly interesting for Euclid because they're using the same CCDs later on. Um, luckily, they are not important for the size of the survey that we're working on, but they will be important for future surveys. So interesting stuff in there if you are into that sort of thing. OK, um, so all of these tests um, with our photometric redshifts and our shear measurements make us happy that these core data products that there are the essential ingredients for our um, cosmology results are, are, are science ready and are robust and that what we measure from the data really is uh, cosmological in origin. So um, here is the cosmic shear result. Let me guide you around this again. Um, over here, B modes, we want these to be consistent with zero. They are, that's good. Over here, these are our E modes, and you've got different uh, bin combinations again. So 5.5, five, these are our highest redshift galaxies. Um, therefore, their light has traveled through the most large scale structure. So you expect to see a strong signal there, a strong correlation between the shapes of the galaxies. And this uh, particular statistic I'm showing you here is the power spectrum um, of these E mode distortions um, as a function of scale. Um, and, and down here, these are the low redshift galaxies. They, their light has gone through very little large-scale structures, so you expect to see very little distortion, which we see. The pink line that you can see here is our best fit model. That is a flat lambda CDM model, a fixed neutrino mass. Um, it includes a model for the intrinsic alignment of galaxies. So when galaxies form in the same environment, they do tend to line up with each other very, very weakly, but the, it is there, so we need to account for that. Um, it accounts for um, baryon feedback. So yeah, another thing, I wanted to understand dark matter and dark energy, and now I have to understand how AGN feedback affects the nonlinear power spectrum. But that is included in here, or at least our uncertainty on it. Um, and we also include um, our uncertainty on how well we can measure the photometric redshifts and how well we can measure our lensing estimates. All right, so this is where we stood on the 9th of July, um, which actually isn't that so far ago now. It seems like an eon ago, but um, it was actually only, only a month ago now. Um, so those of you who, who have known me for, for some time, um, will know that ever since my first uh, sort of um, result with gravitational lensing, so it was the first big large scale wheat lensing survey, um, ever since then we have had results that are in tension with Planck. And I really, really would like to not be in tension with Planck, which is very unscientific. It's a very unscientific uh, position to be in. I shouldn't really care what our results are, I should just be careful that they are correct. Um, but there are lots of decisions that you have to take with, with your analysis. Think of the work that you're doing at the moment. There, there are always decisions that you have to take. And um, we wanted to be sure that those decisions were not biased by uh, my desire to <laughs> agree with Planck. So uh, we've been doing this now since uh, 2015. And indeed, it's great to see all of the other lensing surveys. And indeed, lots of other cosmological surveys also now introduce some level of blinding in their analysis. The way we do it is we create three versions of um, the catalog. One is the truth, and the other two are um, modified in such a way that when we look at our three different blinds, A, B, and C together, the minimum to the maximum differ by two sigma in uh, our offset from Planck. And we don't know whether the truth is the bottom one, the middle one, or the top one, so it could go either way. Um, so, uh, Oh, I realise I haven't told you what's on both slides. So this is the sigma omega m plot that we saw earlier. And because this is just cosmic shear that I'm showing you now, you've got these very long um, bananas here. And over on this side, we've got this S8 parameter, which is just a combination of the two. And in red, this is Planck. 
Um, so uh, we took a poll as our unblinding party, which I thought you might be interested in. Um, so we asked our, all of our uh, members of kids who joined our unblinding party, which one would you like to be the truth? Okay, so um, A was the one that agreed well with Planck, B was a four sigma tension with Planck, and C was a three sigma tension with Planck. Now, most interestingly to, for me, most of the kids team really wanted to be four sigma in tension with Planck, so we could really say yes, it is true, <laughs> um, with a split between the other two. And uh, which one do you think is the truth? Uh, sort of half, half between a, um, a three sigma and a four sigma tension, knowing that our results probably wouldn't differ too much from what we've found before. Um, so uh, there you go, unconscious or conscious biases. I think uh, the moral of this story maybe is that everyone should be thinking about some way to blind their analyses because um, we always have our own internal desires about what we want our results to be, and, uh, and that's not very scientific. Um, Matthias Bartelman is our unblinder. He holds um, three versions of all of our papers. So the way we do this is we, we analyze everything all the way through to the end. We write three versions of the papers. The papers go to Matthias. He stores them. So if you ever want to go back and see that we really haven't changed anything since unblinding, you can, you can talk, check in with Matthias. Um, and, and that's how we managed to publish so soon after unblinding. So this is the truth. This is the, the result which is uh, in three sigma tension with Planck. Um, now the three different contours that you can see um, here now are no longer those three different blinds. Um, they are now three different ways that we can analyze the data. So um, people who like working in real space uh, will like the blue contours here. People who like Fourier space will prefer the pink contours. And then in the back, we've got some uh, yellow contours, which is a statistic that's kind of a bit of both real space and Fourier space. Um, the main thing to take away from um, this slide is so no matter what sort of statistic we use to analyze our data, we get very, very similar results. Um, you may be thinking, why is this one so far off? And actually, this is the statistic that I am least happy with because it is much more sensitive to our modeling for intrinsic alignments and baryon feedback. Um, so actually, we're moving away from using this statistic now as it's um, less robust than the other two. Um, good. All right. So um, what I've got here is just you know, I was saying that there are lots of choices that you can make as you do these sort of cosmological analyses. And uh, all of uh, what you can see here is the uh, constraint on, on this particular parameter here. Again, it's a combination of these sigma eight and mgr m. And what we're doing here is just we're changing the way we decide to deal with our uncertainties on the shear measurements or our uncertainties on the photometric redshifts or the theoretical uncertainties. And what you can see is it doesn't really make any difference at all. So um, even, even if I had really wanted our result to agree with Planck, I couldn't have done it with just changing these, these choices. We're pretty insensitive to those different choices. Um, we can also look at um, what happens if we throw out a different redshift bin. So we've, we've got our data split into five different redshift bins and we can throw one out uh, in turn. Um, now our first three redshift bins that we're removing here essentially carry no information. <laughs> they're such low redshift that their light has hardly traveled through any of the large scale structure. Um, and so you don't really see much difference if you remove those three redshift bins. See more of a difference when you throw out either bridge have been four or five. Um, and that, that kind of makes sense if you think about basically that's half of our information is in bridge have been four and half of our, our information is in bridge have been five. All right, so if you throw out half of your data set, you do expect things to move by about one sigma. But that is very hand wavy, and we do not like hand wavy. Um, so in um, Marika's paper, um, she does a full um, Bayesian internal consistency analysis um, that was motivated uh, by a fabulous paper by um, Pavlos Lemos and, and George uh, from Cambridge. Um, and uh, what this has shown is it's drawn out a problem with our second redshift bin. Um, so let me take you uh, around this in a little bit more detail. So this is our data vector here again. And what we've done here is we've analyzed it with two cosmologies. So we've had one set of cosmological parameters to constrain redshift bins 
one, three, four, and five, and another set of cosmological parameters to constrain redshift bin two. And then we ask the question, are these two sets of cosmological parameters consistent with each other? And in all of the other cases when we look at bin one versus the others, or three or four or five, yes, they're perfectly consistent. And so that difference that you see between bin four and five is perfectly expected given the statistical noise in the survey. But redshift bin two really is an outlier. And you can see this here, that this best fit model in blue here really doesn't encompass the data here. We've got much higher signal in redshift bin two than we'd expect. And this comes out in the analysis, you know, two, three sigma differences. Um, so definitely something wrong with our second redshift bin. But let me remind you that if we remove that second redshift bin from our analysis, it doesn't change our conclusions at all because it carries very little cosmological information. Indeed, all it does if we remove that second redshift bin is to improve our goodness of fit. Um, but it still indicates that there's something more that we need to learn there. And uh, we always like to learn things. So let's go back to those photometric redshifts. We can only currently test our photometric redshifts up to, redshift bin, uh, up to a redshift of one. Right, but there are more high redshift galaxies out there and it's very noisy, but there's, it could well be that this particular redshift bin has got some high redshift um, outlier bump. All we need is about 10% of outliers to give us that sort of signal. So something for us to work on there, definitely, but it's not going to change any of our conclusions because if we remove this bin that's definitely an outlier, it doesn't change our overall results at all. So that's an interesting one to note down if you want to do some picking of our results at later. All right, I have been totally remiss and not talked about our academic cousins. Um, so uh, these are our constraints compared to the fabulous dark energy survey here and the fabulous hyper supreme camera survey here. So we're in really good agreement with the other lensing surveys and just to take away from this note that, um, gosh, all of these five are correlated with each other, but the point is that all three surveys, these are independent surveys, independent teams, independent telescopes, independent cameras, uh, they're all finding something that's on the low side uh, compared to Planck. All right, so in the last uh, 10 minutes that we have, um, I'm going to tell you about the three times two point analysis. So this is when we build in the clustering information as well from the our overlapping spectroscopic surveys. Um, so we've got the, this is the three times two point analysis. So this is our cosmic shear results. We are adding in the galaxy clustering. So this includes the uh, barren acoustic oscillations that you can see here. This bump here is the barren acoustic oscillations and also the anisotropic galaxy clustering. So that's the redshift space distortions. Um, and this is data from um, a paper by Ariel Sanchez et al. Um, and uh, one of the complexities here is how do we model the galaxy bias? Um, as I am running a bit short on time, um, I'm not going to go over this, but basically we have to connect uh, a perturbation theory model of galaxy bias with our halo model that we use to model the nonlinear power spectrum. Um, but there's a fantastic paper by Benjamin Yukimi that shows that all of the modeling choices that we have um, affect our constraints by less than about 0.1 sigma. Um, but it does mean that um, for our galaxy galaxy lensing analysis, so that was the third of the two point statistics, we have to throw away most of our data. So these gray patches here are data that we've had to throw away because our model isn't good enough, um, our model of the galaxy bias. So that's another thing that I really want to improve for the future um, is how do we model galaxy bias on these uh, very small uh, nonlinear scales because that will allow us to extract even more information from this technique. Okay, um, so I showed you um, internal consistency in our data set when we remove different redshift bins. We've also got lovely consistency between these three different probes. So uh, this is constraints on S8, which was that combination of uh, the clustering of matter and how much matter there is. And this is omega M here. In um, pink, you can see the constraints from the cosmic shear analysis that I've shown you already. In purple, this, this is what happens when we add in the galaxy galaxy lensing data. Unfortunately, it doesn't add very much because we're having to throw so much of that data away because we don't know how to model the galaxy bias. Um, but the galaxy clustering data from BOSS 
really nails the value of omega M. And so that allows us to really break the degeneracy that we're seeing here, to give us these nice tight constraints in, um, in red. Um, so if you ask what is the offset between these plank constraints in grey here and our new constraints in red, it's a 3.1 sigma offset. But I'm just showing you one projection of a multi-dimensional space here. Um, and you know, there are many other parameters where we agree very, very well with plank, mainly because we can't constrain those parameters at all. So for example, the Hubble constant, uh, the tilt of the power spectrum NS. In all these other dimensions, we agree very well with Planck. So if you want to quantify differences in our results um, over the full parameter space, uh, then we've got a two sigma tension. Um, so, so what does this all mean? Um, three sigma, two sigma, it's, it's, it's not the four sigma difference that we have with uh, Adam and Reese's results uh, on H0, so I've uh, used PowerPoint to very unscientifically put in his constraints here, which you can compare to the constraints from Planck. So it's not that big statistical significance of four sigma, but it, it is on that edge of being um, rather uncomfortable. Um, I hope I've managed to convince see that uh, we really have our systematics under control or at least that we've quantified it and folded through all our uncertainties in those systematic errors through as nuisance parameters so our errors encapsulate that. Um, so if we're happy that there are no systematic errors with the CMB which I'm sure George will tell you there isn't and I trust him on that one then you get to this uncomfortable point of well what's going on with the flat lambda CDM model uh, that means that it cannot um, explain both our high redshift and low redshift universe simultaneously. Um, there are so many different theories in the literature to try and resolve the H0 tension and the S8 tension. I just pulled out one here that I, I think is, uh, is interesting. Um, so this is one exotic alternative. Now this is with our previous data that they're showing here. Um, so decrease the error bars by a factor of two and you're, you're where we are today. Um, so this sort of highlights the offset between Planck and uh, the and the H naught constraints. And this particular paper is looking at coupled dark matter and dark energy. I mean, very exotic uh, alternatives uh, to the flat lambda CDM model. But if you couple dark matter with dark dark matter and dark energy, then it um, brings both the Planck results in line with the uh, the lensing results and the H0 results. So maybe there's something there. People have been experimenting with a fourth neutrino, um, allowing um, for big uncertainties in the neutrino mass, um, early dark energy models, very strange dark energy models with uh, ghosts. There's, there's all sorts of stuff out there um, to start getting excited about. Um, so let me summarize then. Here is our main result. Um, we have this tension with Planck. Uh, I feel very confident now this isn't systematic errors on our side, um, but I'm waiting for George's questions. <laughs> um, what we can see from this three times two point analysis is our tension is not in terms of omega m. Um, it really is in terms of this clustering parameter. So it is that we're finding that the distribution of matter in our universe today is less clustered than you'd expect from Planck. And what I hope I've been able to do today is just give you a flavour of just all of the effort that we've gone to to validate this result with mock surveys, null tests, image simulations, independent analyses, and that everything's folded um, through. So I'm looking forward to your, um, your questions. Um, is this the time to start throwing out the Flatland CDO model? Well, it's, it's only a one in a thousand chance that we've looked at somewhere unlucky. So, all eyes now on the dark energy survey and the hyper supreme camera survey to see what they find as well if they can continue to find low results similar to ours then then we might start really questioning whether the flat lambda cdm model is sufficient to explain our observations and um, so there we go there's the kids team in happier days when we could go to tulip fields together um but there was some a ridiculous hat contest in lockdown as well which was quite amusing and um, so i will leave it there and um open the floor to some questions thank you very much kathleen um i have been advised by one of our more experienced colloquium organizers that it's better to stop
the recording before the questions, so I will actually stop the recording now.